We were talking. You were talking about the book before you. Uh, before you wrote the book, you weren't much on books. Uh, before I wrote my book, I wasn't much on books my whole life. You know, I was. I when I was uh, in school, the the only A I ever got was in gym class. The rest were C's, D's, and F's. But uh, you know, it took me two years to write that book, and uh, it's very difficult. I I give kudos to professional writers, and mine was extra hard because I didn't want to write it like everybody else's. I wanted to write it different. I wanted to, you know, most books from actors, from directors, producers, stuntmen, uh, they're all the same. They give you a little picture and they tell you a little simple story, nothing real, you know, nothing, uh, um, nothing that really happened on a set. Um, they always keep those things away from you because, uh, you know, they're nervous. They're afraid they're gonna lose a job in the future. They're afraid somebody's not gonna like them. You know, and uh, I was always a fan of books uh, about uh, actors, old time actors, directors, you know, old and new. And uh, they were all the same. They never really, uh, yeah, you know, never really fanned out. And I just wanted to, to do something different. And I came up with the way I wrote my book, which keeps you, I think, and many people think, that keeps you interested from the first page to the last page. And that's, I got very lucky, I was very blessed. And, you know, my co-writer, Justin Stanford, um, the first uh, three, four weeks we started working on this book, um, he would buck heads with me because he would say, you, nobody writes like this. You know, you just can't. It's because he's a professional writer. And I said, that's just the point. You know, I don't want to write like everybody else. I want to I want the audience to be in my head. I want people who read who's reading this to be in my head and to go through it like it was happening right then and there. And that's what I tried to do. And I, I jumped from one thing to another sometimes, which I thought made it unusual and interesting, but I always came back. Um, and uh, I told you real stories, good, bad, ugly, funny, um, exciting, unbelievable, things that really happened, which most people, nobody's ever done. So I think, uh, you know, this book is kind of the first in doing that because nobody really has the guts. And I didn't do anything to disrespect any, anybody. I try to do it in a humorous or in a usual way or in a fantasy way. You know, sometimes I'd said things that you had to use your imagination on. Um, and that well, was there, up to you. Yes. There's a story about Toby Hooper who keeps disappearing to his trailer. And <laughs> you like... You never say what he's doing in his trailer, but we all know what he's doing in his trailer. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, I can't be begin to exaggerate because if you work in the movies, you know, after every cut print, to walk in your trailer um, nine times out of 10, you know, is saying something. And that was Toby Hooper then. And, you know, I knew Toby Hooper from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre just the film, I thought he was a genius. But, uh, you know, the things and the situations that I saw on that show, I, I mean, if you were doing, if this book turned, in, if ever this book turned into a movie, that would be one of the scenes I would wanna create, that whole <laughs> invaders from Mars, the things that happened, you know, with Toby Hooper's lawyers and Menachem Golan's lawyers, the old, I call it the, the showdown at the OK Corral. And uh, I, I don't know if you read that part, but yes, uh, I did. Very funny. And yep. uh, to see that visually, you know, I mean, it will always stick in my mind. And the people who read that, it's the truth. And I try to put you there, which most people don't do. You do. You uh, let go, go, sorry, go ahead. No, but I was saying after uh, three or four weeks, my uh, co writer, realized oh okay now i understand what you're trying to do you know i like it you know it's so different you know and then we gel well it really is let me set the stage for people let me give you a proper introduction so guys we're talking to a legend martial artist uh stuntman stunt coordinator you have been in over 130 projects as far as i can tell and uh you have now written a a book 
Um, I should even say, you, I got a little bit of credits here. Sword and the Sorcerer, Revenge of the Ninja, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Critters, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Total Recall, Army of Darkness, Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. I've got my Bruce Lee shirt on here. Uh, Titanic, Oceans 11, 12, and 13. You've worked with Toby Hooper, Paul Verhoeven, Steven Spielberg, Scorsese, John Carpenter, Tim Burton, David Fincher. You are uh, so gifted. You've been at the center of this thing for so long, and you have now written a book about your experiences, and you're here to talk with us about this. So I just wanted to set the stage so that we people have a little context. Um, why? So given what you were saying, why did you decide to write a book? You know, I, I retired a few years back and uh, I sat back and I said, uh, OK, what am I going to do now? Uh, I thought of uh, number one, I thought of a script um, to write. I did a series of ninja pictures, so I decided to bring the ninja back, um, um, the American ninja, so to speak, but in a different, whole different concept, a uh, whole different look, whole different mood. And I started writing a script. As I was working on the script, bringing back memories, it's by the way, it's called Ninja the Resurrection. It's gonna be directed by uh, uh, director Alone Newman. Uh, he's a very well-known up and coming director from Israel. Um, the only thing that's holding us back now to begin with is uh, the money, <laughs> which is the most important. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, Anyway, I, I started writing that and I started bringing back memories as I was writing the script, you know, uh, about certain things, doing some research and on all that. And all of a sudden I thought, wow, wouldn't it be a great idea if I wrote a book? Uh, my life, very unusual. You know, I'm just a punk kid but from Brooklyn. By the way, the first thing, those, those different parts of my uh, life that you mentioned, you know, martial arts, stuntman, actor, you know, all those things, you forgot the first thing. I was just a punk kid from Brooklyn. Um, you, you know, growing up in the 50s, um, playing on the streets, uh, the 50s was a very unusual time to grow up in. And then um, going to the 60s, which is another unusual time to grow up in. And I saw that even more, even though in the 60s I was a young kid, you know, my friend's big brothers, I would see what they went through, you know. So I saw generations and plus my parents and my grandparents from the 30s and 40s, you know, those kind of things existed, you know. So, uh, so uh, I decided, boy, that would be neat to try to bring out some of the things that happened, you know, during my time from when I was born until I was 13 years old, I moved out to California. By the way, it was a big surprise. Uh, I had no idea I was gonna live in California. But uh, needless to say, if you read the book, you don't understand what I'm talking about. But, uh, uh, you know, then you get to, from, from Brooklyn, New York in the 50s to, to the 60s, uh, um, late 60s, um, um, coming out to California. I was in Brooklyn, I was uh, quite an athlete. You know, like I said, in gym class is the only place I got uh, uh, an A. Uh, I won an award. Uh, a physical fitness award, John F. Kennedy Award for best physical fitness in the sixth grade. But uh, so I was always an athlete. I was a monkey. They called me a monkey. So bringing that to finding martial arts, bringing that into my experience. And then martial arts brought me into the movies and the movies being a stuntman. I had no intention of being an actor or try acting, but then I, as you see in the book, you read in the book, you see how I get into acting also. I have my tastes in acting. Um, at first I hated it, I didn't understand it. But then uh, I grew to understand it. Uh, I was scared to death to act, to say words, to do motions, to do things on film. I just wanted to do my stunt, get out of there, whatever it was, was you know. But uh, uh, um, I just grew into more of an understanding into acting by the people I worked with, um, stuntmen, actors, directors, and uh, realized that I had that kind of stuff in me. The people that I met, the people I worked with, um, taught me some acting. Did When you were, quote, I, I can't call you a punk kid from Brooklyn. I would never be so disrespectful. But you will say that. When you were this kid in Brooklyn, did you have 
any Hollywood heroes? You know, you obviously never thought you would end up there, but did you have people that you admired on the screen? Oh God, I explained that at book. Yeah, you know, I, I would, uh, I was a big fan of old movies. And the reason being is, uh, you know, my grandfather, my father, they would watch movies. You know, the only channels we had then was, what was it, two, four, five, seven, nine, eleven, and thirteen. Those are the only channels. Twelve o'clock, everything would go black. Um, uh, and uh, early in the morning, about four o'clock, it would come back, come back on again. But uh, I was a big fan of, you know, uh, Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd. Buster Keaton, Gene Kelly, James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart, John Wayne. I mean, you know, Barbara Stanwyck, um, uh, people like that, you know, just uh, uh, Edward G. Robinson. I can go on and on and on um, for, for certain reasons, uh, you know, from, from uh, you know, John Wayne to Jim Kelly, two totally different people. It was because of... Uh, uh, a lot of it was because of their physical things that they were doing. A lot of it was because of uh, the way they would act or the unusual things that they brought. Then when I met Bruce, then when I saw Enter the Dragon, uh, actually before all Bruce Lee's films, Chinese Connection, Fist of Fury, even before that, I would see, you know, Hong Kong films in Chinatown, you know, which I loved. Jackie, um, um, Oh, the one-armed swordsman. Oh, I forgot his name right now. Forgive me. Uh, the original one-armed swordsman. Um, but uh, when I saw him, I was in awe. Um, you know, then we go on to uh, Bruce Lee. When I saw Bruce Lee, I was taking martial arts. I was in awe. Everybody copied Bruce. You know, when you're a kid, everybody copied him. So, um, uh, you know, I decided when I wrote the book, I just tell my life story. And I was the range of the movies, the things, the people that I met, you know, being a punk kid from Brooklyn, you know. And when I say that, I'm saying, you know, I, I don't have any family in it. Uh, there's no reason why I should have gotten in it. You know, it was just pure blessing and luck. Because, uh, you know, that that wasn't my way. I was, wasn't trying to be a stuntman, wasn't trying to be an actor. Martial artist, the only reason... I started martial arts is because I didn't have any friends. I came from Brooklyn to California, and I thought that was a good way to learn something because I was always so small frame, and uh, you know, uh, never want to fight, never back down, but never want to fight because I was so small. But then when I found martial arts, as I explained in the book, um, it uh, it uh, was something that I, I I loved. You know, I met this teacher Douglas Wong, uh, kung fu martial art teacher. That's where I met Albert Leung and James Liu, Robin Kane, Todd Takuchi. I can go on and on. Um, and these people uh, uh, that I saw as I was taking lessons, as, as I was learning, uh, these people were in my classes, in my school. And uh, it gave me so, so much insight in martial arts. And the time I spent, you know, the seven, eight years I spent in martial arts, there specifically, maybe eight, nine years, it was like uh, five times, you know, it was like, uh, you know, 45 years worth because I learned every day, I would learn so much. And uh, when I learned, uh, when I got into the movies, I met some stunt people that were uh, uh, some of the top stunt people in the business. And when I got in, these guys were cowboys, uh, gangster type. Uh, they thought martial, martial arts were, was a joke. Sure, there was a Jean LaBelle, uh, there was a Gerald Ukamura, there was a Gerald, uh, um, people like that, you know, but they really only did acting stuff. They never really did big, huge fights, you know, little acting scenes and little teeny fights and not stunts, but I got into the stunts. And being that I was a martial artist, stunt people, these old stunt people, um, uh, from before me, um, they thought we were all jokes. You know, people like Albert Lyon, James Liu, Jeff Amata, Rick Avery, uh, Michael Vendrell, we all came in at the same time. And they thought we, we were all clowns. But uh, 
there was such force into the martial arts, putting it into action, into television and movies in America. When I came in is they had no choice but to use us because there was no other people then. You know, those people that I mentioned, we were like the first teenage looking guys, young adults, martial artists, you know. And luckily I was a stuntman, martial artist. People like James Liu and Albert Leong, they were just actor martial artists, weren't really stunt people. They, were do, they wouldn't do fire burns or car hits or big high falls or, or, or things like that. Crashes on a motorcycle. You know, they would just specifically do martial arts and acting. You know, people like Rick Avery and uh, Mike Vendrell and myself were stunt martial artists. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had it in two ways, being a stunt man and being a martial artist. So, you know, back in the middle 70s, that's when I started. That's when we all started. And uh, it was a beautiful thing because, uh, you know, I would work two, three jobs in one day. It's unheard of. As I'm going through the book, I'm, I'm seeing there's a lot of dirt in the book. There's a lot of stories about people. I wouldn't call it dirt. Know. It's not dirt because it's factual. It's the truth. And uh, it's nothing bad. It's just what happened. And uh, I try to make it humorous. You know, when you say dirt, I have to stop you because it sounds like it's I'm saying something bad. May I say, okay, okay. Yes. unflattering yes. stories. Some people come through looking pretty, uh, some, I'm thinking Sean Penn doesn't look great in the, in the book. Yeah, but uh, it's funny, isn't it? It is funny. You know, because funny. you know Sean Penn. You could read other stuff about Sean Penn. You know, this stuff that I tell you at Sean, about Sean Penn, nobody ever knew. You know, this is one thing of the crazy things that he's gotten into, yeah. you know. So uh, if you read it, it's a, it's a horrible story. And, uh, you know, he's a, you know, you could say he's a sleazeball, you know, but, uh, and a weirdo uh, in a lot of ways, you can say he's a genius and a very creative guy at the same time. But these are things that happen behind camera, you know, um, off camera, weekends when we had off, you know, um, uh, before we would shoot or after we would shoot, you know, I would tell you stories that happened that most people don't tell you. I mean, when you read that story, uh, you know, uh, when the cops came upon us and he said, you know, it's them, not me, you know, mm -hmm. didn't you laugh? Yeah. 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 You no, know, it's, it's funny. You yes. know, it's, you know, at the time it wasn't funny, but later on it's funny. Do you think though that what I guess what I'm trying to ask you is do you, discipline your martial arts background? I should say you're correct me if I'm wrong. An eighth degree black belt is that correct? A uh, sixth degree black belt. Sixth degree. Sure. Okay. Yeah. A um, lot of people have uh, wanted to honor me, giving me a tenth degree, and I try to explain to them, wait a wait, wait a minute. You know, I, I I I have a rule, and it's a very good traditional rule, is if you don't work for something then you don't deserve it, you know? Yes. And I stopped working when I got my sixth degree because I got into the movies and things like that, made it family life so you don't have any time, even though you work out. But when you get degrees, you work out with your teacher, you know, and right. that's how you get degrees. And after that, so that's why I explained to them, but go on. I imagine the discipline of martial arts was a tremendous asset for you in your success because you've had a, a career that lasted through the decades. You never became so injured that you couldn't work. You know, you worked through their stories in the book where you're talking about working through tremendous pain and adversity and things that had happened. I imagine a lot of that comes from the work ethic associated with the martial arts. Am I correct in that? You're absolutely right. There is no doubt. And when I talk to people, I tell them to, whether it's martial arts or swimming or gymnastics, Take something, you know, even I talk to football players, I talk to baseball players, athletes, soccer players, basketball players, you know, uh, uh, um, dancers, you know, take martial arts because, uh, you know, it'll be good for you. I promise you, it teaches you martial arts, teaches the five things that you need for those things I mentioned, which is timing, coordination, distance, focus, and power of the mind. 
And that's what martial arts develops. You talk in the book about how uh, Chuck Norris was sort of your gateway. You'd finish this tournament. You just finished this tournament. And then here comes an opportunity to be in a scene with Chuck Norris. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I was competing in uh, my last tournament. You know, when you reach a certain age, you have to start making money. You know, there's no money in, in tournaments when in trophies, you know, and uh, that's what happened. Uh, this happened to be my last tournament. And I took second in uh, three divisions, uh, weapons fighting and hand forms. And uh, some people came over to me, a few people came over to me, said, uh, hey, wait a minute, we want to talk to you. How would you like to be in a movie? And it kind of went over my head. I had no idea what they're talking about. I was studying to be a cop um, in college. And, uh, and uh, they explained to me, Chuck Norris is doing a movie at LAX and we're looking at some people that, uh, that would look good on film and uh we'd like you to fight chuck get beat up and and uh, i said well i don't know and they said well we'll pay you 500 dollars in cash and that back then 500 dollars in cash to me for one night uh i had to work two three weeks to get that kind of money um uh, so i said sure yeah so i went down there make a long story short uh, there was 50 60 stunt people on the show, LAX, fighting, crashing through windows, getting blown up, getting shot. And I'm looking all, at all this and I'm just amazed. And, you know, and I said to myself, I can do this for a living, but how the hell would you get into this? And, and I was nervous about asking people there, you know, so, so, but I decided uh, that uh, uh, I wanted this. So at the end of the night, when I left, um, uh, that was my desire. And luckily circumstances arose as you read in the book. You know, I was uh, uh, at certain places at the right time, met certain people uh, because of certain situations. Like I said, uh, my girlfriend was working at a motorcycle um, pipe plate place, uh, uh, exhaust systems. Kirker Pipes, and uh, just so happens uh, the uh, owner knew these two stunt guys that came down, Ronnie Rondell and Roy Harrison. They happened to be the, the two of the world's best stuntmen back then. Uh, again, Ronnie Rondell and Roy Harrison. And uh, my girlfriend was a secretary of this uh, Kirker Pipes and she would uh, meet them every time uh, they would come in and say hi to a good friend of theirs. And um, she mentioned my name and uh, day after day, after every time they came in, she would mention my name, finally said, OK, well, meet your boyfriend. And uh, that, you know, I won't tell you more. You get bored. Yeah. You know, the story is great in the book, but, you know, just things happened in my life uh, that just got me closer to to what my career, what my life was going to be. And it, it, it's funny the way it happened. And. It was, I was very blessed again, very lucky and very blessed because stunt people of that day never saw anything like me. Now there's thousands of me, but then I was, you know, one of a very, very few, a handful in the United States of America. And, uh, and these people saw that. I mean, I'll give you for instance, how they realized that I was something special. When, if you would shoot me, if you would shoot somebody, you know, they would take a bullet hit and they would just go backwards, fly backwards and fall on the ground, right? I would take it one step further because I would see this and I'd go, wait a minute, if I'm gonna be noticed, I gotta do something different because there's a lot of bullet hits, right? I don't wanna be just like the same guy, right? So what I would do when I took the bullet hit, I would jump up like I was doing a fl up flying double kick, right? As I was taking a hit, I would get up like five feet in the air, right? And when I would hit my max, I would fall back on my back from five feet. Now imagine that, a flying double kick in the air. And at the max, you would just throw yourself backwards and it would look like six feet in the air and land on your back on solid cement. No pads, you know, 
they thought that they never saw anything like that. You know, I would go up two story building, 20 foot uh, uh, high building and jump off the building on the solid cement where most, all stunt people needed a pad. I wouldn't need a pad. That's because of martial arts. So things like that brought me in faster, quicker, more people heard about me, more people wanted to meet me. Have you had any lingering physical issues because of the stuff that you did when you were younger? Hell yeah, <laughs> hell yeah. I would heal, you know, I would sometimes get major damage because I would go above and beyond. Um, you know, you wanted 12 feet, I said I can get to 16 feet. You wanted 16 feet, I said I can get you 22 feet, you know. I, I would always try to max it out and move the camera around and explain to them, even when I was working for somebody else. They trusted me a lot. Uh, I learned very quick. I worked for some of the best in the world at the time, and I soaked up all the information. You know, I wasn't afraid to go to the cameraman and say, you know, hey, what lens are you using? And he would tell me a 40. I would say, why are you using a 40? Or he's 70. What's the difference between a 40 and a 70? You know, you would take time at the right time and ask, where most, most stunt people never, uh, never dreamed of doing that because they were too scared or nervous. It wasn't that department, you know? But I thought if I knew that when I was in front of camera, if I knew what they were shooting, I would know what to do and what to show them and what looked better. Most stunt people don't do that, you know? And how I figured that out by having having um, uh, heroes, like I mentioned to you, Gene Kelly, James Cagney, you know, people like that, Harold Lloyd, mm -hmm. you know, all those guys I mentioned, you know, I would see them. I have so many long sequences in my career. It's because of those guys, because they believed in long sequences, cutaways, too many cutaways, you know, takes you away from the action. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned those guys, Charlie Chaplin, uh, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, you know, those were, and you mentioned their physicality as well, but they were also creators. They were the people that were coordinating this stuff. So w from a very, it sounds to me like from a very young age, this was just being, you know, you were absorbing this like a sponge. And then you brought that, whether consciously or not, you brought that with you as you made your own way through these films. You're absolutely right. I, I, I got that subconsciously and I never knew why until I got into the movie business and, and I couldn't figure out why everybody was doing the same thing. What I saw with other actors and other people I saw in movies that I idolized was doing different things. All these people were doing same, the same thing. And then when it came to the fighting, um, you know, I'd say they're doing the same fighting, doing the same type of fighting. You know, what, why, you know? And I would start putting, you know, I would, excuse me, I would always listen to my, my boss at the time when I was young, but you always have this liberty. And a lot of stunt people from the very beginning are afraid to take this liberty is your stunt coordinator will tell you what to do. Your boss will tell you what to do and you do it. But there's nothing saying that you can't do something before or after or in the middle of that, right? As long as you do as you're told, right? From your director or your producer or your boss, whatever your, whoever, if you're starting at the beginning of your career, there's nothing to say no. And once you do it, most of the time they like it. And that's what I did at the very beginning. I wanted to be different. And everybody took notice, whether it was my movements, uh, even working with top actors, um, I would be in the scene and um, most people would just do what they're told. And I felt like I wasn't doing enough. I wanted to be noticed. And I would do things that I wasn't told. I would improv and they would love it. They wouldn't say anything. They would appreciate it 99.9% .9 of the time, you know, and they would gain more respect for you there. Um, you know, your, your bosses saw that, your actors saw that. I mean, that's how I got together with James Woods, you know, which is, that's a great relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he saw that I was uh, 
with the first movie I was uh, uh, working for him on, there's rehearsals when you put together, let's say a fight. You know, the director takes you with the cameraman and a bunch of other people, handful of people, six, seven, 10, 12 people, um, the heads. And uh, you put together a fight, uh, you show them all. And um, uh, um, uh, you're acting as the lead actor because you're stunt doubling him, you're fight doubling him because the actor has no time to, you know, sit there for days, hours and days and to do this. And most actors don't have the physical ability to do this. Um, so that's what one of the things you're hired for. And uh, Woods had a lot of time off and he would just watch. He would sit back and watch. And that's how our relationship grew. Um, he admired that. And uh, we became, I admired him. The guy's a genius and a close friend of mine. Still to this day, we talk, uh, you know, maybe once every couple of months. He wrote the introduction to your book. That's a funny introduction. Mm -hmm. I think I've when I read that, I go, what are you doing to me? I said, you're killing <laughs> me. I said, is that what you see? He goes, that's what I see. And I go, okay. You know, but God <laughs> bless him. Yeah, you know, every time, uh, uh, movies upon movies, TV shows upon TV shows, every time I would show up on set, and uh, if you were a new person he was talking to, he would call me over, and he would spend 15 minutes telling you, another lead actor, about me. Because that's how much, that's how close he was to me, and that's how... Uh, that's how he uh, loved the things that I did and my work, he appreciated. We were just very close friends and we were very straight. We were always very straight with each other to this day. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, he's a very misunderstood guy, a very funny guy and a very smart man. Um, he once had... Uh, uh, a change, 13 pages, full of dialogue. Um, and uh, he was going on set to do it in 20 minutes. He literally went to his uh, room and I saw this and I'm not exaggerating. And he memorized the 13 new pages and I couldn't believe it. Wow. I couldn't believe it, yeah. He could act, he can direct, it's wonderful. As you talk about the, your experiences, I'm wondering because of the length of your career, you saw so many, uh, you've, you've seen the, the business evolve. Is it, is there still, I, I want to, I want to phrase this question appropriately with the rise of CGI blockbusters and everything being so computer based now, do you think there are as many opportunities for young people like you were in the seventies to break into the business now? You know, there isn't, there isn't, you know, people, uh, the danger in most cases that people want to take away from uh, the action scene that you've created. Uh, so they go more to CGI. Um, it just depends on the circumstances on the show, who you're working for, who's working with you. Um, uh, the uh, the heads of the departments, the directors, um, the producers, uh, they have a lot to do with it because they give you the things you need and they listen to you. People like Steven Spielberg, um, genius. Um, everything I did for him on Indiana Jones, he listened like it was his first time. Uh, he put me into the same platform as him when we were working out that train sequence, me doubling River Phoenix. Um, why? Because he does his homework before I got chosen to work in that movie. He had to find out who I was. So he spoke to people and he got good words on it. So the minute we, we met, we had a good time. Uh, I tell you a lot of funny stories in the book about him and I. 
you know, uh, he thought I was an unusual guy and I thought he was an unusual guy. Um, but he's, uh, he's literally like a kid in a candy store. He will give you anything. If you say you can do it and you produce, there's no problem. He'll follow you. He'll believe in you. Like the motorcycle sidecar thing, when I had the, uh, the motorcycle flip in the air, um, I had a lot of kickback on that. Didn't believe it could happen. It could work in such a way. I told him, believe me, I've thought of this kind of thing before in different situations. Now I, we're in a perfect situation. We're able to use this. Let me go to effects and props and work this out for you and show you rehearsal. We have plenty of bikes because I bought them. My God, I bought 50 bikes. You know, we had plenty of bikes for that scene. Um, uh, so Stephen did, and uh, George Lucas did. Um, and uh, I went and I put it together and I brought them in the back lot of Universal and I showed them um, how it worked. And uh, they were in amazement. They couldn't believe it. Uh, uh, and I tell a story in the book that uh, Lucas loved it. Spielberg thought that it was too much. I mean, imagine, and this is a true story. Imagine Luke, uh, Spielberg thinking something is too much, you know, because you, when you think of Spielberg, you think of, you know, big, you know, uh, uh, out of the ordinary. Uh, but nevertheless, he decided to go along with it. He asked me if I can tone it down a little. And I said, yes, that's no problem, right? But we were gonna shoot it, but he was worried about it. So we shot it. And as I tell a story in the book, when we brought it to a theater to show it for the first time, after it was put back in, because in the book, I tell you a story, that, that scene wasn't in the movie originally. In that, that whole motorcycle sidecar uh, scene wasn't in the movie originally. Um, Vic Armstrong told them to call me because Vic Armstrong wasn't available. Remember that guy who doubled River Phoenix, the guy you loved, you enjoyed, you know, that's, that's how it happened. I explained that in the book. Um, so he's just a, he's just a creative guy, great guy. But then you take somebody like Paul Volhagen, you know, um, you know, he's a mad dog. He's, he's insane. Well, he's, he's a piece of work. You know, he has, uh, no feeling in his body, Does, don't, doesn't care. As I explained to you in the book, if somebody gets hurt, the danger situation, you know, I, I tell you a funny situation with me, you know, uh, taking the bullet hits on the escalator, you know, uh, I, I was trying to explain to him how to shoot it because you just can't, you don't take these, uh, these grenade hits on your chest, you take, you know, shotgun hits, but he decided to go triple, quadruple loads, you know, and, and, and imagine, um, imagine me letting you take a sledgehammer and hit me in my chest. That's what, how it felt. But when I tried to explain how to shoot that, he blurted out, oh no, look, now this stunt man is trying to tell me how to direct. And Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sven Thorsen, Joel Kramer is in the background just laughing. Yeah, you tell him, Steve. You tell him. You tell that man. He's crazy. They would just laugh. Sven took out his hot spoon, right? He got out the hot spoon. <laughs> Don't you love that? Uh, That's that crazy. Story. I, I'm sitting there. And when he, uh, who's the actor? I forgot the actor. Robert Davi. Uh, yeah, Davi. Such a true story. And imagine sitting there and Sven just giving a flat front snap kick to his chest and him just falling back on his butt. I mean, my mouth just opened. Arnold's mouth just opened. But that's typical for Sven. And, and Sven, you know, you know, you know, Davi, you're such a pussy, Davi. Yeah, yeah you, you know, da, Davi's a, then, you know, this is, uh, this is when Davi wasn't uh, the guy he is now. Now he's quite big. He's made it, so to speak, especially in New York, you know, that type of stuff. Tough guy, you know. But believe me, he's a, he's a nice guy, but he's far from a tough guy. He tries to act tough, but 
you know, imagine being with Sven Thorsen and Arnold Schwarzenegger and trying to act tough. It's just impossible. Yeah. And they would always put him in his place in a funny way. And one and that story was was funny. Um, the hot spoon story. We all got it. Dobby had no sense of humor. And, uh, you know, he's the one that told Sven to get up. Can I read the, ch the chapter of the title? Or you can tell people the chapter of the title. No, uh, read it. Chapter 57 is Total Recall, director Paul Verhoeven, What a Moron. Um, <laughs> no, as, as, as Arnold and Sven would say it, you're a moron. You're such a moron. <laughs> The, the chapters, the titles of the chapters, I got to say, there are, let me see, there are 111 chapters. This is over 750 pages. It's pretty chronological, too, and you have taken us through your entire career. Chapter 38, Kirk Cameron, the Pampered Prince. Funny, he was a kid then. Yeah. Uh, Sean Penn, the Sean Penn story, it's, it's Nicolas Cage, it's Sean Penn. You know, I just talked to a director who worked with, uh, with Nicolas Cage, and by all accounts, he has turned into a very eager, hungry, like he just wanted to do the work. But we're talking about kids in the 80s, and it was wild. I, I, uh, I spent, at that time, I spent a lot of time with Sean. And uh, I, I left out a few stories with Sean because the book got too big. I, le I left out about 350 pages. Oh. I got a few stories, but uh, at that time, Sean was a wild man. At that time, he was married to Madonna too. And I took out a story about uh, uh, myself, Andy Armstrong, who is Vic Armstrong's brother, English stunt coordinator, second unit director, Jeff Jensen, um, uh, Sean Penn and Madonna went to race some cars in the dirt and, and um, Madonna standing there at, uh, at Indian Dunes. It, does, it doesn't ex exist anymore, this place. It's called Indian Dunes. And uh, screaming at Sean Penn, um, you MF, I want to go home. I can't stand this place. It's full of filth. You know, you hang out with your scum friends without me. And Sean Penn would just ignore her and just say, shut up, B, the word B. I don't like to say bad words. Yeah. But uh, it was hilarious then. He would laugh and I would keep a straight face. But uh, I left out that story. But Sean was a wild man. In those days, as you read in the book, I mean, the things he did uh, in that movie. There's a story about Gary Busey. I don't want you to tell the story, but it is just affirmation of every crazy Gary Busey story we've ever heard. And you've got a great one. Uh, the title of that chapter, chapter 33, Gary Busey almost killed my director with cocaine. <laughs> yes, baby powder. <laughs> um, go, go ahead. I mean... A, a, a man, you know, you think you're seeing a lot of things in the movies, as, as especially uh, I mentioned a few times that I've always been a people watcher from the very beginning. That's why I, I've seen a lot of things, you know, because I've always never been nosy, but always kept my eyes open wherever I was. And, and things always happen whenever I was around. When people want you around, you see things, you get involved in things, yeah, you know, so, so, uh, He's like no other. I mean, imagine you being on a set thinking that you've seen everything, you know, because by then I've seen a lot. And I've always said to myself, boy, Steve, like they say, you know, you ain't seen nothing yet. And sure enough, you know, I, I tried to get you in my head and have you visualize what went on in those frames and those moments. Um, uh, at that, you know, with the, with the baby powder, a la cocaine, supposed to be cocaine. But to, to see that, you know, I mean, it happened in a matter of seconds, but it, it felt like an eternity. And to explain it, I hope you had a good time reading it. because I did. 
And I love that movie too, Eye of the Tiger. It's a great movie. Yafet Koto is in that. And uh, William Smith, you call him Bill Smith, but I call him William yeah. Smith. He was a, he was a wonderful guy. You know, uh, a hell of a athlete in his prime. You know, he was kind of uh, at, at his end then, such a nice guy. And Busey was, uh, that was, uh, you know, during his madman days. And, you know, I tell a couple of stories uh, on that show uh, and a couple of other shows with Busey that I had uh, um, good luck to work on. You know, uh, you had to watch your P's and Q's in front of Busey. You could never make him look inferior. And as you explain, you know, if you do, I, I talk about a uh, uh, somebody on the set, you know, um, saying something to him and he didn't like it. And uh, he got him fired right there. And he's gone the way of Kirk Cameron with the religious thing. He pops up on uh, Gary Busey. I, I, he used to pop up on religious television. And I'd be like, well, it's Gary Busey. What's that Batman character? What's that Batman character? Two-Face? Uh, yeah, you're very smart. Uh -huh. Yeah. And he's, uh, you know, I spent uh, quite a bit of time with him, had a lot of good conversation with him. If he... If I, I found uh, whenever you run up a, with a guy like that, you have to have great common sense, but you could never back down. And whenever you want him to do, a stunt coordinator is a psychiatrist. You know, I'm working with literally hundreds of department heads and each one has, has a personality um, that you have to deal with, including mm -hmm. actors. So when you're working with people, you have to try to understand them right away and you have to co come up with situations and uh, conversations dealing in so many different ways with every person on the set to get what you need or want uh, for them. And uh, with Busey, it was always uh, um, keep... Uh, uh, mind your P's and Q's, but stand your ground in a humorous way mm -hmm. with Busey. Yeah. And uh, I always found uh, uh, people like that. I always found I got I got a lot from that and a lot of respect. Uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I've got a few questions that I got from I, I you know people knew you were going to be here, so they sent a few questions in, and these may open up a, a few avenues here, but. Um, do you ha do you approach uh, work on one style of movie differently? This is from Nate. Do you approach one style of film differently than you would approach another? For instance, would you, if you know you're going to be in a martial arts scene, is that a different set of preparation than if you're going to be in Alvin and the Chipmunks? Right? Do you show up the same, or is it a different set of different mental preparation? Yeah, that's a very good question, Nate, and absolutely not. Not every movie every situation is different and i i try to explain that somewhat in the book i'm not sure where i did but i know i discuss things like that you know i i uh, like i mentioned before i watch people stunt people directors producers writers people on the set all the time and everybody always stunt guys and uh, uh, stunt coordinators, whenever they put something together, they always did what they knew. Um, what I did was I took the script and I said, okay, this script is whatever. It has to do with martial arts. Then it's a martial art thing. Then I go to the actor and I have a conversation with the actor see where his head or her head is at, uh, what she likes to do, what she's talented at or he's talented at, um, dancer, martial artist, swimmer, um, whatever, um, gymnast. Um, if it's uh, uh, another type of a picture, motorcycle picture, you know, and there's uh, fights in a motorcycle picture, you know, I make sure that I don't do martial arts. I take a character who is supposed to be physically fit, 
because if you're a motorcycle rider, you must be physical fit. You know, dirt bikes, let's see, dirt bike movement, right? And I, you know, I use punches that are very basic that have maybe a little different movie movement. Uh, and I create it. If it's a Western, I take Western fights, depending on what scene, the story point of the movie, if it's dramatic, you make it dramatic, uh, you talk to the actor, you look at the uh, props, you look at the uh, 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 the sets, uh, they get you into a mood. Um, you always, I always try to do something different. I don't copy other people, even though everything is always a copy. What you do is take that something and try to mold it into something different, depending on your sets, to the location, the look, your actor, the story point of the scene and the movie. Um, I try to do that throughout my career. Um, if I worked the movie, I worked with Van Damme. You know, the fights I did in that were totally different from the fights I did, you know, in Revenge of the Ninja. You know, it, you know, it was more rough, more realistic, you know, more, more movement, more body language with Van Damme. Um, um, than, um, than uh, playing a, a character. Well, I wouldn't say body language because there was a whole lot of body language with me playing the silver mask ninja. But you're seeing, seeing what I'm getting at. Every Nate, everything, movie, every scene you get, don't put in what you know. Try to create something different, different type of fight, different type of stunt. Um, different type of situation, different type of lenses, different type of way of going about it. Um, try to create something different, then you'll get noticed. And that's what happened to me. And I came in at the right time when, you know, uh, they were starving, but didn't understand how or have enough guts to do different things. And it just blossomed, you know, from the middle 70s on, you know, um, it just exploded and I happened to be there. You mentioned Revenge of the Ninja. Uh, yes. that, that's a good lead into the next question. Adam asks, I'm sorry, this is Jason. This is not Adam. This is Jason wants to know more about working with Show with Show Kasugi. Was he kinder in person? <laughs> I know this is a can of worms, but was he kinder in person than his on-screen roles? I'll say this, Show Kazuki, Revenge of the Ninja, we got along wonderful. Uh, it was like a family. Uh, it was a click like no other clicks. I've done $100 million movies and I've done Revenge of the Ninja, which was a $2 million movie. And uh, I, I got more gratification on Revenge of the Ninja as I did in a $100 million movie per se. Um, it was a wonderful moment in time where you had a wonderful team that we all listened and respected each other and enjoyed each other. And, uh, you, you know, I, I'm talking about uh, three guys, Sam Furstenberg, Shokazuki, and, and Stephen Lambert. Um, we were a team and we all respected each other and we all knew what we needed from each other and, and the gifts that we had and the places that uh, we were there for. And uh, when it came to the action, at that time, San Furstenberg wasn't familiar with action. This is, was his first action picture. And Shokazuki was, uh, uh, he had some basic idea being that he came from Enna the Ninja, right? The first ninja picture, but for me, he, he didn't know much from Enter the Ninja. He didn't learn much from Enter the Ninja. What me drew, what I drew from him uh, was he did a lot of live shows um, before he got into the movies. You know, he worked at uh, um, uh, Magic Mountain. You know, he did live shows at Magic Mountain, martial arts shows. And if you do live shows in front of live audience, and they applaud you, you know you're doing something good because it's a big part of, you know, doing action in movies, doing it live. 
you're just doing it in front of the camera, in front of millions of people, you know, another layer back there. Um, so I knew he had that gift. So they trusted me, being that I came from action. Sam Furstenberg trusted me. Shokazuki trusted me because he knew I came from action stunts and I was a martial artist. So I understood what he wanted, his needs, where Sam Furstenberg wouldn't understand, um, you know, when it came to the martial arts. And then when it came to, uh, you know, the movies, the lenses um, and the camera work, um, Sam Furstenberg and I got, you know, were a great team um, because I, I knew a lot about that stuff as Sam Furstenberg did. And then we had a wonderful um, uh, cameraman, wonderful DP, and we had a wonderful script supervisor. Um, and between that package, really, it was a, just a wonderful team. And like I said, Shokazuki was a wonderful guy. We all had a lot of laughs. Shokazuki at the time was very traditional, wasn't Americanized. So we played a lot of jokes on him, which at first he didn't understand. That's why it was so easy at times. And he played a lot of jokes. He learned to play a lot of jokes on us. So it was a beautiful experience. Unfortunately, after that, the domination, because, and I explain this in the book, because he didn't get the lead, so-called, he kind of took it out a little bit on Sam Furstenberg on us and I, um, which we had nothing to do with it. That, that you know, it's out of Shmulek's control, Sam's control, let alone, I'm just the stunt coordinator. What do you want from me? I'm not, but, you know, he just thought to, to take it out on us and our relationship, as I explain in the book, uh, even though it was there and we communicated as far as business, the friendship was, wasn't there all the time. You know, it was very much business. There were times where it came out, but, but you know, it faded. But we had a wonderful time and it was a great memory. And I love the guy dearly. And, uh, you know, uh, it, as I explain in the book, you know, uh, from Revenge of the Ninja to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, two completely different pictures, but yet they're my favorite from low budget to high budget. You know, those are my two favorite pictures. Um, they're a lot alike, but so different. You did a uh, a guest spot on Unsolved Mysteries where you were a suspect. This comes from Adam. Has anyone ever recognized you from that episode and thought that, you know, has it ever led to any interesting interactions? No, but, you know, that was a, a pretty cool time for about two and a half years. Unsolved Mysteries. I can't remember why, but they called me and they, they, they made me their stunt coordinator. But part of that was an agreement is whenever they had a part, which was every episode, they needed me for stunts, that I would come in and play this part whenever they called me to be the stunt coordinator. And usually you get two different contracts, you know, but they wanted it on the same contract. Now, I never really cared about that part of it. Um, um, otherwise I would have been a real wealthy man. Um, you know, the money didn't seem, it was the challenge, you know, they always gave me a good part. So I go, well, okay, I could, I could forget about that extra contract. I like the part that'll help me for the future, you know? So I always enjoy, I probably did about pretty close to 10 unsolved mysteries, playing different parts, different characters which, uh, which uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And, I, and, you know, Robert Stack, no different than he is. <laughs> he, he's the same, the same. Okay. In real life, he's the same. Nice okay. guy, but he's the same. You know, he's got that, that, uh, that, that just bland tone and, you know, doesn't communicate, doesn't talk much, but, you know, very gracious, very nice. And uh, he, he's always interested in watching you work 
And I told him that, uh, you know, I mean, God, the untouchables, you know, I used to watch that when I was a kid, you know, and he got a kick out of that, you know, and I said, Hey, you got a big fan here, man. That's great. Uh, this, I'm winding it down. This is pretty much my last question, and I'm going to tie it into something that Gary asked. Yeah, uh, we'll he, do this again. Gary, if you want to, we'll do this again in the future. Absolutely, yeah. Let's let's keep in touch, and we'll. Uh, I'm going to reference everybody to the book on our way out here. But Gary wants to know. He wants to know who your influences are. Now we've already talked about who you know Buster Keaton and all these guys, John Wayne. So I'm going to I'm going to slightly alter the question as you move forward with this project that you told us about, you're trying to get this, this movie shot and filmed. So what influences are you leaning on filmmaking wise? Maybe as a, a director or a screenwriter, who are you kind of drawing on? Um, I'm drawing on old school. Uh, my film is going to be uh, as old school as I can. Uh, there'll be uh, uh, visually some creative things visually on it, uh, but the action, I'm, uh, I, I believe that people, uh, you know, Matrix was wonderful um, for what it was, but I call that fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that uh, if you show people something that's above and beyond normal, you know, things that people can't normally do. You take it to the extremes, whatever it is, um, uh, and you put it into a situation, um, a good moment, a good scene. Um, that's how you make something different. Um, you know, I admire, admire uh, Tarantino. Um, yeah, you know, guys like that. Uh, I admire Spielberg mm -hmm. for different reasons, completely different reasons. Um, I admire um, Sam Furstenberg. You know, I, 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 I admire uh, Paul Valhaven, as crazy as he is. You know, there's something that I could take out of that. You know, he's demanding. He's other things with demanding, but you have to know how at times to be demanding, you know, in certain situations, uh, creative conversation, uh, quick to the point. Uh, you have to be agreeable. Um, you have to take other people's opinions because it's not only you. And uh, that's what I'm gonna have in my movie, Ninja the Resurrection. My, uh, my actor, I want, I hope, um, is Josh Brolin, a man with multiple personalities. And that's what this character has, multiple personalities. Um, and uh, took two years to write this script, uh, many changes. Um, it's very different. It's not, it's more story than action but it has an awful lot of action in it. But the story is more important, which is not norm uh, for martial art pictures, which I believe in. You must have a great story and um, it'll make you cry. It's got two or three moments which will make you cry. And the, the scenes, the, there's, there's wonderful scenes in there and visually it's in my head and uh, the characters are all in my head. And, Josh Brolin's my lead, and uh, there are other many other characters in it that are going to be very special. You know, you don't forget. I told you I loved old movies, and I've seen a lot of old characters that I want to bring back in different ways, and a lot of new characters or medium characters from my time that I want to bring back. You know, uh, imagine a young Sven Thorson. <laughs> there we go. That is exciting. Uh, we are... I, I heard, I've heard things that Sven Thorsen said that are so precious and so different that I put in this movie, you know, that you're going to laugh your ass off. Wow. You know? Sven Thorsen character is one of my characters. And only the people who know Sven Thorsen really will understand what I'm talking about. 
So I have many different characters. They're going to be very, dialogue's very unique, you know, very serious movie, but very funny at the same time, very exciting, very visual, you know, well, you know, Hong Kong movies, Asian movies, very influenced in me because they're very visual. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be a lot of that, but enough of that. We'll speak again someday. someday. Yes. Yeah. You'll have to come back and tell us when that's, uh, when that's, when that's happening and it's, it's immediate, uh, for now, guys, we're going to wrap this one up. The book is called from this Stephen Lambert from the streets of Brooklyn to the halls of Hollywood. It is available right now. I will put links in the description of this video where you can go buy it. Uh, amazon.com. There you go. Amazon.com. It comes highly recommended. Uh, you've just heard, this is the tip of the iceberg. There are so many stories here. You have seemingly worked with or talked to, had some experience with just about everybody. And you came away with a story from most of them, it seems like. Well, we didn't touch much, but we touched a lot. It was uh, very enjoyable. And out there uh, in your audience, I thank you. I hope you enjoy this. Get the book. You will love it page for page. I promise you, you take care and be safe, everybody. And thank you. Mr. Lambert, thank you very much. I'm going to end this uh, quoting Doris Day. This has been a big tickle. <laughs> thank you, sir. Guys, thank you for watching. Check out that book and uh, continue the conversation in the comments below. Mr. Lambert, thank you. We'll see you next time. Hi, friend. Take care, everybody.